Welcome. I'm Stephen Lopes, the founder and host of the Men of Bronze podcast. My guest tonight is Chase Hughes. Chase Hughes is a 20-year U.S. military veteran who now teaches businesses and elite government sectors behavior profiling and persuasion techniques. We dive deep into some topics like how as civilians we fall in line with authority and why that is. We talk about how we can level ourselves up socially, become more influential, and how we can gain information without asking questions. Chase is the number one best-selling author with the Ellipsis Manual and has a new book coming out in July, which we talk about in the podcast. Please rate, subscribe, share the podcast with your friends, and most of all, enjoy the episode. Chase, thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast today. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me on, man. So, Chase, tell me more about the Ellipsis Manual before we get too big into uh, the behavior side of things. Where does one get the ideas and the topics uh, to write a book so profound? I spent 20 years obsessed with human behavior. And it started when I was a kid. I got turned down by a girl, basically. And I went home and I literally typed into Google how to tell when girls like you. And printed out a massive stack of paper. And I found myself just getting completely obsessed with behavior because the more I was able to see through people's facade or their, their mask that we all wear, Hmm. not that anyone's fake. We just, we, a lot of us live in fear that we might be exposed Mm -hmm. and it, it humanized everybody. And I think I had social anxiety and that really helped me to cure it knowing that I could see people's fears or insecurities. I never felt better than anybody. It just felt like uh, they were equally as screwed up as I was. Fair enough. Yeah. I think we're all hiding behind something, right? Um, We all have that fear, like you said, of being found out and we might not even know what being found out for. Yeah. Which is true. Which is a really scary thing. Yeah. So that's very interesting. So this kind of got you into what you do now then you were, you were a military you were in the Navy at the time, right? When this happened? Yes. So I, I, I worked forward with that obsession, went to college for it, which didn't give me much at all. And then I bought a bunch of persuasion books, went to a bunch of seminars and it was, mm. it, it pissed me off over the course of doing all this. I've spent a lot of the taxpayers money on a lot of this and I spent a lot of mine and it was, it would, it was upsetting that I would buy a book that says this is, elite persuasion tactics or highly advanced persuasion tactics. And it was all the same crap. Like Hmm. the tech, the techniques were really random or they're designed to work equally well most of the time on some people. And it was just like, it's hard to buy a giant book. And then it turns out after reading the whole thing, I've only highlighted one paragraph. Right. It could be summarized in a little 10, like a little pamphlet or something. Yeah. And, but uh, some people are really good at just fluffing things out or making mm. it into this giant piece of work. And I wrote the ellipsis manual because it was the book that I had spent 20 years looking for and I just couldn't find it. So I put everything together in that book. Uh, and I'm, and you've, you've looked through it. There's no fluff. Like there's not a single page has a story or any fluff in it. Yeah. Pure meat. That's interesting. So yeah, I like the idea of you creating the the book that you were looking for. Um, you know, that's the same premise of the Mindset Bootcamp podcast. The whole idea is to create a podcast that I want to listen to. Yeah. So uh, I find it very inspirational that that's, that was your motivation was to create a book that you needed to fill a void that you had. Yeah. Now in all of your research uh, and all that time it took, Did you find, did you figure out or did you unlock the secrets to, I mean, for lack of a better term, talking to women? You know what I realized about talking to women? And I know most of your listeners are are dudes. (laughs) That uh, the, if you, well, I had a mentor who was a 70 year old CIA psychiatrist who had worked on a lot of secret, super secret stuff. Mm -hmm. And he had me meet him one day. And I, he's like, bring your, bring those books about women. And I'm, I'm a probably a 20 year old douchebag. At the <laughs> and I met him at a restaurant. I brought a bunch of books in a big bag and he said, pull them out. 
And I put them out on the table and he said, find me something in that book that doesn't teach you how to pretend like you're a real man and pretend and trick people into thinking that you've got your, your life together. And interesting. And it shook me that, that that's what those things were that we were just tricking biology into thinking that, you know, we, I've got my stuff together. These are all the ways to fake it. And I found out that if, if you just like become a good person, handle your business and you, mm -hmm. you live a decent life and you level up your social skills and become a better communicator, a better person in general, then the dating stuff is a byproduct of just right. really just leveling yourself up. You don't need dating advice. You just need to handle your business and, and live a good life. Right. I think that's, that's pretty fantastic um, information. I mean, and that goes through every aspect of our lives. You know, people say, like, oh, how can I be you know, successful or happy? Um, well, don't focus so much on the money making or the happiness, you know, be an honest person, be hardworking, you know, pay your debts. You know, if you tell yeah. someone you're going to do something, do it. And good things come from doing those things. So, so true. So, yeah, I really like that. And one of the things that um, I saw you talk about in a different podcast was uh, you had a guy reach out to you and he wanted to. Um, get with women or whatever he he wanted to do and you said well let's facetime and uh you you put him up on your phone and you saw that his house was a mess yeah and you thought instantly you were like this guy wants this for the wrong reasons he hasn't even picked himself up yet to clean up his room yet he wants to go out and manipulate women which was yeah. which was so odd right yeah like he he wanted to control other people he wanted to learn some super advanced techniques. And I said, you can't even control yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm willing to bet a thousand dollars cash that your bed's not made and your bathroom counter looks just like your kitchen counter does. Yeah. That's, you need to have control over yourself before anybody else. Cause I, I get people emailing me all the time. Like what's the exact script to create a Manchurian candidate or to do some kind of extreme thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I always respond with, I can give this script to somebody who's really high up and high leveled up on their personal life to where they automatically generate focus and communicate with other people. I give it to somebody who's not capable of communicating that way. And their, their life is a mess that it's just going to, it's not going to do anything. The yeah. words don't matter as much as who's the person is that's saying the words. Yeah. You need to work on yourself first before you can change the world or, or whatever your goals are. Right. It's so true. Yeah. Interesting. So what are some, like if someone did want to um, learn some new skills or techniques, what are some questioning techniques that we could use as an average civilian to read people better in situations? Cause that's one of your expertises, right? Is how to read people, that sort of thing. Yeah. And if, if you wanted to do some questioning techniques, I, my first recommendation is to ask less questions Interesting. And, more, and make more statements. So let's say you wanted to get something sensitive out of a person. And I say, Stephen, let's go to the grocery store. So you and I are standing in the produce vegetable area and there's a, a young woman that's stocking the, the cauliflower. And I say, you have 60 seconds to go up to this person without being awkward and figure out how much she makes for a living. You mm -hmm. have 60 seconds. And so we would initially think I would go up there and ask, hey, how much do you make for a living? <laughs> a, you might get your answer. She might just say, I make whatever. But immediately you're put into a column in her little mental Excel spreadsheet that says socially awkward or weird. Right. You might get the answer, but you, your chance at building rapport with this person, male or female, no matter what, it is destroyed. So when we need sensitive information, we tend to, it's better to ask or better to use statements than questions. So for instance, I go over there to her. I say, do you know where the baby carrots are? And she says, oh yeah, they're right over here. And as we're walking, I say, I just read a fantastic article on LinkedIn that says you guys just got bumped up to $22 an hour. That's fantastic. Congratulations. And she looks at me like, what? No, we're only make 1675 here. Hmm. So she's willingly given this information up and you haven't even asked a question. I never asked the question. So it's, 
it's if, and if she's asked later, did he ask you how much you make? She said, no, no, no. He, he thought he'd read something on the internet and I corrected him. So she didn't provide information. She provided a correction, which is very different. So if we ask, if we use statements, we get a lot more out of it and the person's mm -hmm. giving it up voluntarily. It's a lot more social. So like the next time you're riding in an Uber, try to use a few statements like, I just read an article that Uber, Uber treats their employees better than anybody else. And you'll see the driver. And then use a couple of statements. They'll say, yeah, I've been doing this for four or five years. And then you use a statement that says, I bet you've got some crazy stories. Hmm. And he starts unloading all this crazy stuff that he's seen. And then you just make another statement. My neighbor's daughter actually started driving for Uber. And she said the other night she witnessed X, Y, and Z. Then the person's going to say, I haven't asked any questions yet. Zero. And they're spilling all of this information that they never talked to anybody else about. And the one thing we're doing, it's easy to think that this is just some kind of cool questioning technique to get information, but we're creating a novel situation for that person. We're creating a scenario that there is unlike anything else. They're opening more than they open to most people. They're a little bit more vulnerable and they're a little bit more connected to us. So just being able to get information out of somebody also levels up the social part of the conversation where we connect a little bit more. Interesting. Is there, is there a correlation to, so let's say this Uber driver is willing to tell his fantastic stories. Um, and you said, Hey bro, can you tell me some sweet stories of being on the job versus you saying, Oh, I bet you've seen some crazy things. Uh, so the statement versus the actual question is yeah. there a difference in how he would react to those different things, even if he was willing to give the answers up? Like, say he wants to tell stories. Yeah. The way you, the way you, you got, you get that out of him. Would you get different stories out of him? The first question, no. So mm -hmm. if he's willing to say, it, you say, "Tell me some interesting stories," and then over time, you're not making any statements and you're asking questions. Now it feels like an interrogation. Oh, interesting. Okay. So if he is willing, that's great. And the um, yeah, right. But after a while, it's like now you're just you're just putting him under the spotlight here. Yeah, because you lose the naturalness of the conversation. Yeah. So we're saying, tell me more. Oh, really? Tell me what happened after that. What mm -hmm. other stories do you have? How long have you been doing this? Are you satisfied with your right. job? And it gets crazy. But in reality, when I said, you know, my neighbor's daughter drives for Uber and she saw X, Y, and Z, I'm not asking him anything. But that statement alone provokes a response. It just opens up the floodgates for him and he's going to yeah. spill it all out for you. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I have like, I have 15 techniques that I teach to elicit information from people using those statements. But it's not just a, a tactic. It's actually good social skills as well. Mm -hmm. So somebody says, oh, I work for a marketing agency. And you say, man, I bet that's really challenging. That's a statement but they're going to respond. It's called a provocative statement. Wow. Uh, do, do you have those in a, do you have those in a book as well? Those 15 things, or is that part of your course? Yeah, it's part of our, we teach it online. There's okay. a ton of online courses that we have now. that are yeah. fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Tell me more about the behavioral table of elements. This thing got started. My mom and I were watching an episode of the bachelor. <laughs> okay. And this was probably like when season two or three was coming out and we're sitting there in my parents study and we're watching this thing, having a glass of wine and she's explaining how the show works. And she said, you know, I like this girl. She's really honest. And this other girl's a bitch. She didn't say bitch. I don't think my mom wouldn't say that, but I'm saying, yeah, well, the girl that you said that was honest lied to this guy during the hot tub scene. Uh Oh, and my mom said, wow, I wish I could have all of your training. And that's what she wanted to use all my military training for was the bachelor. Right. Decrypt the bachelor. Yeah. I'm going to predict who's going to win. <laughs> and so that night I go to bed and I'm probably, this is 15 years ago. And I'm laying there in bed, in the bed I grew up in. And I'm thinking about when I was a kid. I learned so much from placemats. My mom had little waterproof placemats that would go under my oatmeal or cereal every morning and every sure. night at dinner. 
and some had the president, some had the continents or the planets, our solar system on it. So there's all kinds of, there's a stack of them. Hmm. And I thought, how could I fit all human behavior onto a freaking placemat? And seven years later, that, that's when that project came out. Wow. And the behavioral table of elements was designed for deception detection. So we would watch these interrogation and intelligence collection videos of interviews and figure out, is someone being deceptive? And then it became a training tool. And then it, you know, the FBI Academy's got a copy hanging on the wall and wow. it really blew up. But for one of those cells and it's free, I give it, I give it away for free. It's hmm. not like you go to my website, spend 50 bucks and you can download it. You can go over there right now and grab it. But the, it, it turned into a training tool and then every cell on the table has to be supported. Every behavior has a minimum of four pieces of academic research in order for it to be included in, in the behavioral table. And it looks like the periodic table, just mm -hmm. mostly because I, th I thought like a giant rectangle would be pretty boring. So I thought I wanted to make it look kind of familiar to people. Yeah, actually, I just shared... Um... I went back in your Instagram feed a little bit. And just before we hopped on here, I put on my, on the mindset bootcamp story, you have a bunch of pieces of paper on the carpet and you're kind of putting together. It's 10 years ago, you say in the post, yeah, you're, you're yeah. kind of, you're kind of building it from scratch there. And then yeah. the second image is the finished product. Yeah. So how many elements did there end up being there? Some get added every once in a while. So okay. we added some and it's a long process. It takes almost a year for us to add a new element. Hmm. Because we have to do cross cultural studies. So, some of those, if you look through the behavioral table, just in that little square, it'll say, This behavior is not popular in Bulgaria. This behavior is not done in Asia. This is more likely to be seen in Farsi and Arabic speaking countries. So, there's, it's that got is a lot fascinating. So, we can grab that on your website then? Yeah, it's just my name, chasehughes.com. Yeah. We'll just type Chase Hughes into Google. It'll, hopefully be the top. Yeah. We're going to have all the links as well on the show notes, all, all that kind of thing. So, um, so you mentioned the, the behavioral table of elements is mainly for deception detection. That's what it was originally for. Okay. And now we use it as a training tool to teach body language and wow. my, you know, my kids even have copies and we'll watch a show for family game night. We'll sit there, my 10, 11 year olds or 11 and 12, we'll be sitting there watching TV and they'll have to identify behaviors as they happen. So it's a lot. That's of incredible. And that's fun learning for them, right? Yeah. They enjoy oh, That's it. cool. So do you have any tips for people like me, just a regular Joe Schmo for deception detection in everyday life? Yeah, I would say people put a lot of emphasis on it. And anytime you see somebody that says they can teach you lie detection for behavior is total BS. Okay. Total BS. I will call BS on that. And because there's no human behavior for deception. It does not exist. We only are detecting stress. Interesting. So one thing I would, I would advise everyone to start looking for is something called blink rate. And this just means how many times a person is blinking per minute. So the average in most conversations when we talk to people is 20 times a minute. So we're speaking to another person. Our eyes are blinking mostly at random intervals. Mm -hmm. but it averages out to around 20 times a minute. And the higher a person's blink rate is, the more that person is experiencing stress. Mm -hmm. For instance, when I probably took the math portion of my SATs, which is our college exams here in the U.S., and yeah. I, my blink rate was probably around a 70 and when I watched the movie, the most recent cool movie that I've watched was Interstellar. That's when, a, if your blink rate goes down, that's when we're relaxed, focused, and extremely interested in something. Mm. My blink rate was probably around a three or a four. So the difference in these is so easy to notice that you don't have to count how often a person is blinking. You start a conversation, does it look normal? Is it fast or slow? And what we're looking for are changes. We're looking for speeding up or slowing down. So if you're on a date or I am a, a trial lawyer and I'm talking to a jury and I see blink rate go up, that's not good. Right. I've got some work to do. And where if I'm a sales guy and I'm starting to talk about payment terms and 
and interest rates and I see blink rate go up, that's a big deal. Hmm. And if we're doing our job correctly and if we're being a person that's worthy of that person's focus because our attention span over time is, is shrunk. It went in 1950, it was around 39 minutes and today it's around 50 seconds. Yeah. It's, it's really bad for sure. Yeah. So we have to compete with Facebook and Instagram. Mm. Our, our words and our mouths have to compete with that stuff because we need to maintain a person's focus. So if we are doing a good job, we're talking about something that person is interested in. You'll see the blink rate drop. You'll see the person blink less often. Mm. And the reason I just threw this one out, there's, there's around 19 indicators I teach people to look for when they become operatives. So I'm teaching a, an intelligence operative or a civilian who comes to one of my courses. There's 19 things that tell you whether or not you're doing a good job or bad job. But if we start seeing the blink rate go down, it's worthy to note what caused it. So the moment, if I'm, I'm a public speaker, I, I do a ton of trainings and seminars, just using blink rate, and I don't want to keep hammering on this, this one behavior, but it is incredibly reliable mm -hmm. because think about the last time you were aware of your own blink rate. I, I'm awfully aware right now. <laughs> I can see that. But it doesn't really happen in conversations. Mm -hmm. And since we're not aware of it, it's unconscious, which makes it really reliable. So when I'm up on stage, I'm talking to people, I'm making eye contact with people all around the room. Mm -hmm. I'll count how many blinks I see in 15 seconds. I'll multiply that number by four, which will give me 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I have the blink rate of the average of the room. Once it starts going up, I will change my position on the stage. I'll change right. the pitch of my voice and I'll start speaking a little bit differently. Or I'll change the subject or the slide that's up on the, on the screen. Try and wrangle them back in. That's right. And that's our job. That's your job because focus is currency. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. I mean, I was just kind of focusing on my blink rate as, as you were telling the story here and uh, trying to keep it as natural as possible. And I, I feel like it was between like maybe five and eight yeah. per minute. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I'm quite engaged with you right now. This is fascinating. Uh, information and focus because we're we're having a one-on-one -on -one here so that's pretty interesting De definitely something i'll try and keep in mind uh when i'm at work and that sort of thing or maybe with my wife it is so <laughs> cool it, it, I, yeah definitely use it with your wife yeah see if she's interested in my uh my stupid hobbies or not <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's oh, cool man. um I don't want to switch gears too much, but I, I really want you to to tackle this one too. Um, in your Changing Minds podcast interview with uh, Owen Fitzpatrick, mm -hmm. um, you talked about the fact that people submit so easily to authority. Yeah, and you talked about the guy in the train, the train conductor outfit. Yeah, doing yeah. weird things. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So this was uh, just to credit the person before I start talking about it. Sure. This was done by the Heroic Imagination Project, which is led up by Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Mm -hmm. Took me a second. Same guy who ran the Stanford prison experiment. So in this experiment, this guy at uh, a shopping mall in London puts on basically a stupid little a train conductor's costume with a little train conductor's cap, no ID, no badge, nothing that says he's a police officer. And he's holding just a standard issue, little Motorola walkie talkie. And you can look this up on YouTube and he goes around, he's telling people, uh, ma'am, you're, I'm sorry, you're about to pass between me and this apple that's on the ground over there, 10 feet away. Please, please go around the apple. And they'll walk up to somebody else and please change hands with your shopping bag. I'd like you to hold that in your right hand, please. Or come over here. Can you please litter? Can you find a piece of trash in your purse or something and just throw it on the ground? And he had about 100% compliance. Wow. He changes out of the uniform. Compliance goes down to like 3%. But it's not just the uniform. So a, a similar study was done in Austin, Texas originally. It was called the Crosswalk Study. Mm -hmm. where a person, uh, just a regular dude wearing jeans and a t-shirt breaks the crosswalk when it says don't cross. Obviously there's no cars coming, but he walks when he's not supposed to in downtown and two or three people followed along. But the same guy go does, he does his hair 
shaves, uh, like, you know, if he had a little scruff or something on his face and he puts a suit on, suit and tie. Mm -hmm. Now, when he breaks the crosswalk, it increases the people who follow him across the street by 88%. Wow. So we tend to assign a lot of stuff to authority, but if you think about it, and for anybody who hasn't, just Google Stanley Milgram experiment, where a person was literally talked into murder in less than an hour, and they had 65% compliance and 100% compliance where people would shock another person. A hundred percent would shock another person enough to kill them at 250 volts. And the shocking one they did in real time, right? They had like this fake zapper. Yes, it was a fake and, zapper with a real human. Right. And the, the random civilians zapped this guy. Yeah. That's yeah. like, I find that fascinating. I do too. And it, it's been replicated many, many times in different countries, different environments, and it has the same results every time. 65% of people will go to 450 volts. 100% of people go to 250. Wow. And Incredible. do you know why it is that we submitted this authority so easily? Yeah, absolutely. And I've spent the better part of my life doing research on this. And mm -hmm. we actually have a class on how to hack a person and make them obedient. But if you go back a million years or I don't know, even a couple hundred thousand years, the average group of people was a kind of a little nomadic tribe of between 70 and 150 people. Mm -hmm. And if you, we did not automatically not just obey authority, but the important part is that we're c consistently scanning for authority all the time because it, it would have saved our lives back then. So if we're not compliant with someone who we perceive to be an authority figure, it could cost us our life, which means that the people who did not really obey authority, their DNA doesn't exist today. All of our ancestors right. did that. And then we, we do have genetic memory. And for anybody that disagrees, how do we know how to smile when we're born? We're born with body language. We're born mm -hmm. with behaviors programmed into us. And another cool fact, we can even inherit memories of trauma of our ancestors. Like our phobias can actually come from a horrible thing that happened to somebody 200 years ago in your bloodline. Yeah, I've heard of that before. That's, that's extremely interesting. I think so too. Um, just, get, just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. We get primed and our brain goes into automatic obedience mode to where I will, I will become obedient 100%, it bypasses our ability for judgment when we see somebody that's an authority. And after 19 years of experiments and research that I conducted, I figured out a way to do this in conversation where we can trip all of those trip wires. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating, especially to watch people try it out and, and use it in their everyday lives. Wow. And are these the kind of techniques that um, say you implemented this technique or if you kind of mastered this technique, is this the sort of thing that would enable you to find that kind of success unlocker that you've been looking for for your career or something along those lines? Or, you know, what's the benefit? So the benefit is that once we have these abilities, we have something that a lot of people refer to as the it factor. Mm. And it's, it can make anyone do anything. When we have authority, we can, we're the ones who get hired for the jobs. We're the ones who get out of speeding tickets. We're the ones getting upgraded to first class. And those are just the people who have social authority. And that's what this is, is manufacturing charisma or it factor. Because we automatically obey those people. Our brain, mm. It's not like we make a choice to do so. We're ne we convince ourselves that our choices are logical. I bought that flat screen TV because I did the research, not because of that commercial. I've never been influenced by any commercials. Yeah. They don't work on me. They work on those other people. So we convince ourselves that our, our decisions are really logical. But when we decide to obey a person or we decide to become very compliant around a person, that decision has been made long before you think you make it. It's already pre-programmed into our DNA to be obedient to what we perceive to be an authority figure. That's incredible. So you might make a decision, you know, 15 minutes into a conversation 
Um, but in reality, the first three to five seconds or something, when you met that person, you've already submitted. Yeah. Or whatever. Wow. That's incredible. I, I can imagine how powerful that would be for someone who does that naturally. Yeah. Like, uh, like a Bill Clinton type of figure or right. on, on the high end and on the low end, we have like a Charles Manson mm. who was able to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, he manipulated people into doing murders, like you said. So, and you, you said that in that uh, other study that regular people, 65% of the time or whatever, were able to, were talked into a murder. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. And that whole thing was, was driven or the idea came from Dr. Milgram watching the, the Nazis get put mm-hmm. onto trial uh, in Nuremberg. And their answer was so similar with each of their interviews. They would be deposed. I'm not sure what they would call it. But they would say, why did you do this? Why did you kill all these people? And all of them would say, I was just following orders. Yeah. Well, he said, is that possible? Can, can normal people commit murder? by just following orders and it's it's nearly every human being is capable of that if they're yes. around an authority figure have you read the book ordinary men no okay yeah i'll i'll get sending you a link to it after it's it kind of outlines the how regular police in germany end up becoming like ss officers and it's it's a true story it's how they you know regular good people good uh police officers become uh murderers Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. So it's it's recommended a lot by Jordan Peterson. It's on his uh it's on his must read list. So I good to know. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. So I'll give you a link to that after as well. Big fan of Peterson. Yeah, we talked about that off air the first time we talked. So yeah. he's got a list of books on his website and it's certainly on there. So um switching gears again, what are some of the laws of human behavior? Something we can either look out for or, or we, we might not know about. So I would, I will, I'll give you the, this four fundamental things and we teach a whole bunch of little fundamental laws, but these are like the first four that I teach in any of my courses. And it's not a law of behavior as in you need to memorize this for a test in a few weeks, but this is a law of behavior that you need to start understanding this. Not just like I wrote it on a note card and I know these, I've got to memorize that does nothing for you. Mm but bring them into a conversation and they, sh- I want them to be in your conscious part of your mind during a conversation. So we're almost seeing people through these, this lens of these four laws. And the, the first law, law number one is that every human being is suffering and insecure. Hmm. Everybody. And someone asked like, what's the definition of confidence? Or how do I improve my confidence? I asked, somebody pulled me aside at my last seminar and I said, you need to understand that everybody you meet is faking it to a degree and just, just let it and not, don't judge them for it. That's all humans. Everybody's faking it. And that'll help you feel confident because the guys you think have got, uh, got everything together, they're faking it too. And the second law is every human being is wearing a mask. So we all have some kind of a a social mask that we start putting on or we start building when we're around eight, Hmm. start getting into these social situations and it gets to be a permanent mask that we wear throughout our lives. And I, in, in my courses, I teach how to pull that thing off to where you can meet the person that's behind the mask because a lot of influence in sales decisions is me selling to the person's mask instead of the person behind it. Right. And that's a big mistake that a lot of people make. The law number three, everyone pretends that they don't wear the mask and we need to be okay with this. And it, of course, a lot of people are going to default to judgment and say, well, everybody's wearing a mask. I'm going to stand in judgment of them, but it's us too. It's right. It's everyone sure. here. But you know, every once in a while I'll get, I'll get that guy at my seminar. Who's like, well, I don't, I don't have, I don't have any of these behavioral traits. I, yeah. I'm not insecure about anything. You know, there's always <laughs> the one, the one guy. Uh, so the fourth law is that we are all a product of childhood suffering and reward. So a lot of our adult decision-making when you're looking or talking to an adult, which actually is just a grown up 
little kid mm-hmm. that, you know, we don't, we don't really like, there's a day that I'm an adult and then I start acting like a grown up. We kind of, we grow up and then we learn how other grown ups act and we're yes. like, oh, okay, that's how a grown up acts. It's a little more serious. Yeah. And you know, we, we pretend to be grown ups, and that's what grown ups are. So we're a child of the stuff that if you, if you're driving down the freeway and some, a hole cuts you off and then reaches out the window and flips you the bird. (laughs) There's a lot of ways we can react to that, but that's the time. That's one of those critical moments when it would really benefit you to see that that guy who just flipped you off is not a dick at all. He's just scared. That's a scared little boy who got bullied or who Mm. had an alcoholic mother or had a, a dad who beat him up or got punched in the face a couple of times in front of his friends and got embarrassed about it. Mm. And that little boy went back to his bedroom one day, crying, looking at himself in the mirror. And without him even knowing, he made a permanent decision that he's going to behave in a way that where no one's ever going to hurt him again. So now instead of seeing an asshole, we're seeing a fearful little kid. That's because that is what it is. And I think it really, even it, even just thinking about those four laws, it does so much for your level of empathy for people that your, your life will change if you can just walk, see people through those four lenses. Right. That gives you a lot of control over the situation. I'm thinking about the last example you gave about the guy flipping you off, uh, being able to sit back and analyze the situation rather than responding in the same manner that guy is responding yeah. gives you so much more control over what's happening not only in your vehicle uh, but just in general around you so true and wow. sometimes like if that happens to me i'll actually make up a story i'll i'll make up a thing that happened to that person hmm. and i will i'll say that i would probably behave the same way if that happened to me right. i was lucky enough not to be bullied and or abused or neglected or anything but i i would make up a story in my head and i'd say he's a human just like i am and that's how i would act most likely if all of that crap happened to me and it really does help we're seeing them from that angle that we're all suffering and insecure and when Mm -hmm. we read people when i teach people how to really profile a human being on our six mx or six minute x-ray course what we're really learning to profile is not the person. It's how they hide their suffering, Hmm. how they hide insecurity because everyone does that differently. And I say all of those things and highly recommend that nobody judge anybody because it, it, instead of making, making you judgmental, I hope it makes you connect and say, wow, they're screwed up just like I am. Right. Yeah. We're all in in this together. Yeah. Just they're screwed up in a different way than me. Yeah. Um, so talking about kind of covering things up, well, you mentioned the whole mask thing and how we start building a mask around eight years old and yeah. it becomes a permanent fixture. Is it common? Because I found in my life when I've self-reflected on this kind of topic before that I sometimes have multiple masks. So oh, yeah. if yeah. I get into a room full of, of Christians or a room full of my buddies from high school, I will, I will talk differently sometimes. I'll act differently. Different yeah. stories will come to mind. What's that all about? That is, is different because we're, we're needing different things from that environment. So in one, you might need connection. and the other, you might need approval. Mm, interesting. And like in this room full of Christians that you mentioned, that's where you need the approval for. I mm. mean, church was designed to make you want approval <laughs> in that environment. Right. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, that, that whole thing is, is what we need socially will depend on which mask we put on. But typically people will go back, back and forth differently. So like we, we've all probably worked for a guy or met like the CEO who's a total badass, just has everything together, rigid yeah. posture, kind of an alpha male kind of guy. Yeah. But we know damn well when he goes home and gets like a one degree Fahrenheit fever, he turns into a baby (laughs) in front of his wife, you know, he gets the man cold and he's out. Yeah. Turns into a little baby. 
Yeah. And now he needs pity instead of significance. Right. So our masks vary. But if mm. I'm able in a sales situation, and this is what I, what I mostly teach at the six minute x-ray. If I'm in a sales situation and I'm able to profile that person's mask, it's not going to change in the conversation. So if I'm able to like modify this person's behavior using some influence tactics, which I could teach if you want, I could teach a couple, mm -hmm. but if I'm, I can do that and the guy's a D bag, I'm not modifying his behavior permanently. I, I will in that conversation guaranteed, but after the conversation, he's going to write right back to being a D bag. Interesting. Why don't you tell us some of these influence techniques? So one that's, that doesn't take long to teach is and I'll give you some backstory here because I really, this technique is short enough that it can fit on a post-it note. Okay. But I don't want the brevity of, of the technique to be lost in how powerful it is. That if, I, if you've read a book called Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, a great book, it, it's very academic. Hmm. And he has a thing called the consistency principle. It's where we agree to do something or we agree to behave a certain way, we're more likely to do it again in the past. So just to illustrate, and I'll paraphrase this, they go from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, and each neighborhood makes around 420 k a year. Like the median household income. Okay. And in each neighborhood, they go door to door and they say, will you stab this big metal sign into your yard? And it says, please drive safe like one of those for sale signs about yeah. that. And in one neighborhood, 11% of the people said they would do it. In the other neighborhood, 89% of people said they would do it. So what was the difference? In the 89% neighborhood, four weeks prior, they went door to door and said, and they, the person would answer the door and the guy at the door would go, oh, hey, sorry, I'm not here to sell anything. I just have a one question survey. I'm going to take up 10 seconds. It won't take any more than 10 seconds. And the person would be like, yeah, what, what is it? And he said, do you support safe driving? Yes or no? Of course we're going to, everybody's going to say yes. It's going to be a hundred. Right. So then he said, since you support safe driving, will you take this really tiny sticker and put it on a window facing the street? It's this big, like it's an inch across. Yeah. So they go in, they stick it on their window. It's like, who's not going to do that? It's just they feel good about themselves. Yeah, they feel good about themselves. And then four weeks later, they say, would you be willing to put this safe driving sign? And the, the guy doesn't announce himself like, I'm the same guy that did the survey mm -hmm. at all. So they just go back and ask. So everybody who said yes and agreed to put a tiny sticker in a window also agreed to put the giant sign in their yard. So this is consistency. If I make an agreement to behave a certain way, a month later, I'm more likely to behave that way. Interesting. So in a conversation, and in the, in the, in the influence book by Cialdini, I, I got to the end of that chapter, I got to the end of a lot of the chapters, and I was like, God, I wish there was a list of how to use this. Because it just talks about, oh, here's a psychological right. quality of people, and it never says, and here's how to use it. It never mm -hmm. got to the here's how to use it part. But here's how to use it. So in the, in the beginning of a conversation, or sometime near the beginning, we compliment a person. Or we say, you know, it's, it's horrible how many, how many people out there are just wearing a mask and they're so afraid of judgment. And then the person, obviously, they're going to nod their head. So bam, we've got them to agree that they're not one of those people. Just by nodding their head, hmm. we've made this small step towards the consistency principle. And they will, just by that one statement, they'll start acting differently for the rest of the entire conversation. You have a more open human being. It's phase two of this, you can follow this up right afterwards. Like, how did you get so open? For me, that was really hard growing up. Were you always this way or did you have to learn it growing up? Because I uh, definitely had to work on it. Just answering the question, you have nailed them down. And they will behave in accordance with what they've just told you that they did. Because the moment that we behave in a way that we didn't, we told you I was this way and now I'm behaving differently, 
we experience an extremely uncomfortable feeling called cognitive dissonance. Hmm. So just a quick compliment, and especially if the person is open, then they deserve that to be complimented on that. But we're going to make them more open, more connected that way. And in the next conversation that they have, they've, they had an experience where they revealed who they really are. They were a little bit more open and they didn't get punished for it. So, cause usually if you're taking somebody's social mask off, even just a tiny bit, the first emotion they experience is fear because they're getting exposed, but they had a good conversation and were a little more open. So the next conversation they have, they're going to be more open because they got rewarded for it. So mm-hmm. we have, we have left them better than we found them. Wow. That's like, that's heavy. I mean, that's I'm, like the preschool stuff. <laughs> yeah, wow. I mean, I'm just trying to like digest that as you're giving it in to me. And it's like, I just find that incredible. Um, and you've got a whole bunch of these is what you're telling me. Yes. We teach a whole lot. <laughs> wow. And how long did it like, I'm assuming you're able to implement most of these on a day-to-day basis because you've been doing it for so long. Yes. Um, one of the questions I had for you was, have you ever had any pushback on this kind of topic, um, saying it's kind of immoral or that kind of thing to either manipulate people using these kind of tactics? Yes. So I get questions all the time. like, And I say, do you think it's immoral to manipulate how I come across to get a different reaction out of you. And they would say, yeah. And they're like, why are you wearing makeup? Mm. Why do you get your hair cut? Why do you, why do you, why do you buy that clothing that has a polo logo on it? I mean, we're already doing that. And it depends on what we're using it for. Cause if manipulating people is bad, then cognitive behavioral therapy to treat depression should be against the law. Right. Because that's extreme manipulation. So if we're doing it, I think that our intent, if our intent is there to help the person and and do the right thing, that's when it makes a difference. Because if I could teach these techniques to a psychologist who could treat depression using this stuff, and I could equally teach it to a guy who could go do a date rape kind of thing with it. Or be a con man or something. Yeah. So I think teaching it, isn't bad. And I don't think there's anything manipulative about it. They're just good communication strategies. Mm. So shaking someone's hand, making eye contact, looking them in the eye, those are manipulative things as well, because people give those as advice. This makes people connect with you. This makes people yeah. like you. And that's why we do it. So all we're doing is really leveling up our communication skills and blaming the person teaching is kind of like blaming uh, Chevrolet for drunk drivers around the country. <laughs> right. It, it seems like people, um, they don't like the idea of them themselves being personally manipulated by someone's uh, tech uh, tactics or, yes. or techniques. Yeah. And, and that upsets them on a personal level, whereas right. they would be the first ones to use it, but they just don't like the idea of it being used on them, which I, I, I can I relate with. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. fair. So if anybody is, has ever manipulated you, it was a result of good communication. So all we're really seeing is somebody saying, I would really like non good communication. I want yeah, the yeah. poorest communication that can possibly exist. You write this out. Don't use any pronouns or adjectives and make it uh. horrible, boring because any good communication, those, the same people who don't want to be manipulated, they watch commercials they click on those Instagram ads. We've all done it. Oh man. They make me sick sometimes. These uh free sunglasses just pay shipping and handling. <laughs> I've ordered that ad. I actually bought some of those. <laughs> I was about this close yesterday. I, I clicked on it and I was like, six ninety nine. It's from Toronto. It's pretty close. Yeah. It's like, no, can't do it. Can't Are do those it. like the nineteen eighties retro shades? Yeah, yeah. The same exact I bought them. They hey, haven't what? arrived yet. Oh, I'll, let you, I'll let you know how they are. Yeah, you got to you got to let me know because I was like, I was putting in my information. I was like, wait a second, this isn't right. This sounds like a scam. This is yeah. too good to be true. Yeah, because they look cool. And I'm always weary about Instagram. The only other thing I bought off Instagram is a this giant. It says the brightest flashlight in the world. Okay. I was like, 
I'm down thirty four dollars. Yeah, sounds nobody, great. Yeah, so it ships from China. <laughs> So it arrived a week ago. So obviously I'm disinfecting the hell out of that whole yeah, yeah. package and everything. So I pop the batteries in it. 30 seconds, the entire thing catches on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the, uh, there's no customer service. There's no. No, no, you're out your money. You can't review anybody. I bought, um, they had a deal on Instagram. This was two years ago. Um, two watches, pay shipping and handling. They had an, an an incredible website. You know, the watches are are ninety nine dollars regular. I'm like, they're like, I contacted them, like, yeah, we're just really trying to build our name. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I'll buy these two watches. It's like fifteen bucks for the shipping and handling. One, <laughs> I opened the box. One watch was in pieces, so it it fell apart during the shipping, and the other one just stopped working about two days in. I was like, this is ridiculous. Which is why I did not buy the sunglasses. Yeah. So anyway, I find that fascinating that you bought the glasses. So you, you got to tell me how they how they turn out. I know. I, I definitely will. I love it. Um, what are a couple takeaways uh, for the listeners that they can uh, that they can either implement or just keep in mind go, uh, moving forward? Do you want some like technique wise, or uh, I'll I'll leave it up to you. If there's something that you want the guys listening to to just take away from what you've said today. It can be one thing. It can be five things, whatever you want. Sure. So let's talk, let's go back to authority and I'll give you a couple of tips here that will level up your authority instantaneously. Okay. The, when we're talking to other people, they're subconsciously reading our body language. The part of our brain that automatically reads body language has been there for 10 million years. It's, Hmm. it's our mammalian brain. It existed way before we developed language. And we inherit the ability, just like we inherit facial expressions. We can also read body language subconsciously. So if our blink rate goes up in a conversation, we're communicating stress to the other person or fear. Mm. So slowness, if we think of speed, like there's another eye movement that you can profile called shutter speed, which is how fast the eyelid shuts and then opens back up. And if you think of an animal that's fearful, like a chihuahua, their little eyelid is really quick or yeah. a mouse or a mouse eyelid. And if you think of a Rottweiler or a, a Doberman Pinscher, their eyelids are a lot slower because they're more relaxed and they're less concerned with threats. Hmm. And if you can do this, it'll help your internal state as well. And this is not just during this, some dating scenario. I'm definitely not a dating coach and that, and that stuff is almost repulsive to me, but not quite. I still kind of, I still like some of it. Sure. But uh, the slowness of your eyelids and slowing down your blink rate really does help because we're making eye contact most of our conversation anyway. So if you use Visine right before a conversation, your blink rate will go down. Your shutter speed can go down. Hmm. And if we think about it, fast muscle movements are all associated with fear, not just our eyelids. So think of that chihuahua laying down, taking a nap in the house, and then there's a loud sound from the kitchen. How fast that head comes up and yeah. reorients towards the potential threat versus the Rottweiler, who doesn't even pick his head up. He just like looks over there out of the corner of his eye. Right, yeah. So that, that tip is one of the ways that we, there's, I think there's 202 ways that I, I cover with, how people perceive authority. But this is a big one that the slower we move, the more trust we create with people and conversations. And this is our hand movements, our bodily movements and everything. So the takeaway here would be try to spend just this week, set a reminder on your, on your Siri, say, Hey, remind me every, I don't know, two hours move slow or something. And you'll get that reminder. And what I would recommend is never move faster than you would if you were underwater in a conversation. Oh, man. In a swimming pool, that's your, that's your limit of speed. Just do it for a week, and it'll start to become an automatic behavior for you. And not only will it communicate that to other people, your body movements will communicate that to your brain. It'll make you calm down more. It'll make you a little more focused. And it, it's easier to manage things and make decisions if you move slowly. Interesting. Do you, do you do any kind of meditative practices as well? Or is that something that you don't 
really partaken? I do. It's probably different. The way that I meditate is not like focused on Buddhism or yoga or anything yeah, yeah. like that. It's very much focused on the principles and the techniques of brainwashing. I'm applying them to myself. Right. I mean, just being aware of your movements, uh, being conscious of, of what you're outputting is, is still a form of, of meditation, right? You're self-reflecting, yeah. that kind of thing. So that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll personally try that this week. Um, I'm a fairly fast moving person in general. I've got a lot of energy, so that'll be interesting for me to try and implement. I mean, obviously if I'm playing out in the yard with the girls, I'm not going to be a sloth out there. Yeah, you shouldn't be, but, uh, should. but, uh, during conversations, that's a good, that's a good tip. You bet. Absolutely. Is there, is there anything else you wanted to give out? Sure. Any, any other tips that specifically you think your audience would enjoy? Uh, how about you give us a tip on how to deal with others? Like, are there certain levels of how to deal with people? Or is that too broad of a question? That's an extremely broad question. Yeah. Okay. So, give me, um, give me something about discipline for the guys. Discipline. Yeah. I just got off a talk this morning about this and this is my definition of discipline. And I think as far as I'm concerned, it's the best and the most comprehensive and it's very short. Okay. Every one of us here has been pissed off at our past tense self before. Hmm. We, had a, we had a major exam and our past tense self stayed up all freaking night drinking or smoking or doing whatever. Yep. Or we go to bed early and we wake up the next morning and the dishes still aren't done. The past tense self didn't get it done for us. So the definition of discipline is when your present tense self prioritizes the needs of the future self over hmm. its own. So I'm more concerned with the future, the benefits of my future self than my present tense self. So now I'm never feeling pissed off at my past tense self. There's gratitude at my past tense self. So at nighttime, it, it's everything from financial stuff to your social relationships, thinking about the future self and all the way down to something uh, even tiny at nighttime. Like I'm, turning my Keurig on. I'm opening it, putting a little mm. coffee pot in there. I'm setting a cup out just for myself. And I am behaving in the present as though I am a butler working for a very, very important man who is me in the future. I go up to bed and I am laying out the clothing, the socks. Uh, all I got to do is wake up. Everything I need is done, completed, and ready to go for me the next day because my butler did it. And that's the concept I'd like to leave your, your listeners with is become your own butler and your life will change completely. I love that. Um, I've heard in the past that the discipline will make your life easier. Um, I think I heard a Jordan Peterson uh, lecture on that one time. It was like three hours long, basically just talking, you know how he is. Yeah. Um, just talking about that, that kind of thing. Like how, if you have a disciplined life, your life will be so much easier. Discipline doesn't make your life harder. Uh, I know Jocko Wilnick has talked about it as well. Yeah. Um, be disciplined and your life will be easier. Yes, it is. A, some people say discipline is a prison and it is in the beginning. It sucks in the beginning. Right. But those people you see going to the gym all the time, they, it's not because they have discipline. That's because they only needed enough discipline to start a habit. Hmm. So you only need enough to start a habit and then it's not, it looks like discipline to everybody else, but it's just something that's a habit for you. Oh, I love that. Well, that's an awesome takeaway for the guys. Um, before we wrap it up, you have written multiple books. Yes. But you have your first fiction book coming out. Yes. And we and have that, to say fiction with big quotes around it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There might be some truth in there, but we're not going to say it. That's so, right. Uh, it comes out in July. Is that correct? Yes. And it is about a mind control plague. Interesting. Give us a little tidbit, the name, a little bit about it. And when we can ex expect to see that on shelves? Probably in a couple months, it'll be out. You can pre-order it on Amazon. And the name of, if you just type in Chase Hughes on Amazon, you'll see it. But the name of the book is Phrase 7. Phrase 7. And it's got this incredible cover art. Um, with like a statue kind of woman uh, underwater. 
Yeah. Pointing oh, at a gun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be picking it up for sure. Um, yeah, and I hope, I hope some of the listeners do as well. Um, I'll be plugging it at your release date as well on the social media for sure. Awesome. And uh, yeah, that'll be great. So I think that was an awesome conversation. We just busted over an hour, perfect. which is perfect. We tackled a ton of information, Chase. I cannot appreciate you anymore coming out here. Uh, I know you've got your boys there with you. So, yeah. you know, setting aside the time to talk to me, I really appreciate it, Chase. You bet, man. Thanks very much. Thanks for yeah. having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chase. Have a good day. You too, man. Bye. Bye.